Dropping the Needle. You're listening to Dropping the Needle, the podcast where all music from all genres is discussed. New releases, classic albums, rediscovered music, signed and unsigned. No ass kissing. Just two guys talking about music. Here are your hosts, Michael Brandvold from Michael Brandvold Marketing and Mitch LaFont. Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Dropping the Needle, the podcast that's been described as if Beavis and Butthead ever had a podcast, this would be it. I'm one of your co-hosts, Michael Brandvold from Michael Brandvold Marketing, and as always, I'm joined by my esteemed and beautiful co-host up in Montreal, Mitch LaFon. How you doing, Mitch? Very well, very well, and very excited to have our guest Brighton Rock with us today. Yeah, so let's just jump right into it. So joining us today, we've got uh, Jerry McGee and Greg Frazier from Brighton Rock, a band that... Hello? How you guys, how you doing? Good, fantastic. How are you guys doing? We're doing awesome. This is a this is a real treat for me because uh, Brighton Rock is a, is a long-time a fan, a band that I've been a big fan of, going back to... Uh, I'd have to say about 87, 86, something like that, when your first album, Young, Wild, and Free, was released in the U.S., and I was in college radio, and it just connected with me, and I played the hell out of it, and actually back then I did uh, a radio interview with you guys that I've got somewhere on audio tape that I should dig up and share with you. All I remember is you talked about hockey. (laughs) Yeah, no shortage of hockey up here. No, not at all. Well, this year there is. Thankfully. Yeah, thank God. I <laughs> got football. Got football, football this year. So anyway, um, you know, Mitch and I kind of like to keep these these podcasts with our guests kind of loose and relaxed and fun. So one of the things we always like to chat with, with our guests about is, do you guys remember what was the first record you actually bought yourself with your own money? Man, I think my first was probably Meet the Beatles, even though it came out like, you know, five or six years before. But I think I was about like nine or ten years old, and I, uh, that was the first one I bought. Before that, my mother would buy me Ktel's greatest hits, twenty-two yeah. explosive hits. I'll never hear those. Oh, I those, still got those. Uh, yeah, those, those, I still those are great. I love those, especially the TV commercials. <laughs> <laughs> I remember mine because I remember I was shining shoes, and my first paycheck I got, I immediately went down to the record store and bought "They Only Come Out at Night" by the Edgar Winter Group. Wow! Oh, wow! Wow! Ooh, Edgar <laughs> Winter. That's a good one. I just saw him a couple years ago. He played here. Um, it was it was uh, it was prior to Ronnie Montrose's death, and Ronnie actually came out and played with Edgar Winter. They they, they kind of jammed together, which was kind of a real treat to see that happen. Wow, yeah. that's yeah. cool. Was he the one that was an albino, or was that Johnny? I think they're both, both are they're both albinos, both. aren't they? Because I I know I saw one of them open up for April Wine at the Montreal Forum, like in. 81 or something but i'm not sure if it's well, edgar or johnny i know I know, I know i know edgar is i don't know about johnny but yeah edgar's got <laughs> white hair white skin he's just as as bleached out as you could get so maybe maybe i saw him open for april wine back in the early 80s one of the two <laughs> what was your first records oh i don't want to admit it i i, I my mine's kind of i wouldn't say an embarrassment but it was before i realized what was going on musically you know when you're a little kid and you're just like oh i want to buy a record but you have no idea what to buy so my the first part- my first <laughs> one was uh love and spoonful okay well, you know they're, 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 they're a classic folk rock band but you know it, it's nothing like what i ended up with being a big kiss hard rock fan you know it was one of those things where you just walked into a record store and it's like i, I want some music Oh, that looks like a cool cover, and you bought it. Yeah, yeah. You know that my my first, and it depends how you want to look at it. The first ones I went into a record store with my dad and pointed to and said, "Buy those." Were the Kiss solo albums. The first ones that I spent my own allowance on was Kiss Dynasty. Okay. Wow. Mitch, why does it not surprise me that everything you bought or bought for you was Kiss? It's because <laughs> it's the world's greatest band. <laughs> And, and and at that moment, that's when you got hooked and became super fanboy, right? 
Right, and that's what, you know, 1979 is when Kiss was, uh, the, the seven-year-old market and the eight-year-old market, which I was at that time, was exactly what Kiss was aiming for. So I was in the proper right place at the right time to buy Kiss. And I still am today. Now, yeah. now, now, guys, you know, so that's, that's what you bought. What do you remember being played in your house, whether it was siblings or parents? I mean, what sort of music were you hearing around the house that was kind of influencing you as kids? Well, I, I was the youngest of five kids, and my brothers were both big, uh, big music fans. My one brother, the Beatles, had played his high school in Scotland. Oh, wow. I remember Elvis and uh, the Beatles getting played. My one brother who went back to London and lived there for a while, he came back and kind of made me like the sponge to suck up stuff. And I remember him playing Led Zeppelin II, uh, King Crimson in the Court of the Crimson King, Black Sabbath, Master of Reality, and then he'd switch and put on Bob Dylan. So basically I got to listen to everything that my older brothers had, plus they had all the records. So they uh, just everything and anything was good. I was taught not to block um, any stuff and just give everything a chance on its own merit and don't close your, your doors as far as say, I only listen to one type of music. So I listen to everything growing up. It was great having two older brothers, like I said. That's yeah. awesome. Uh, my father was a DJ when I was a kid. and So like from the day I was born, we listened to my father on the radio. I was living in Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario. And uh, so whatever the, the, the hits of the day were, uh, that's what we'd be listening to all day long. So... You know, pretty wide exposure as far as music, uh, whatever, back in 63 up to 68, I guess, those first five years, uh, every day, it's all, whatever was on the radio back then, so you, you take it, that's what I was listening to. So you probably heard Stevie's favorite song, Having My Baby, before he even heard it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> so, 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 yeah, ha having, a, having a dad that was a DJ had to be just an immense influence of the amount of music that you were being exposed to. Oh, absolutely. It was, uh, you know, back when you're a kid and you, they have uh, the one day a year where you get to go to your parents' work, you know, see what, what your dad does for a living. And so, you know, we go to this person and then we go to where my dad worked and then everybody, Oh, this is cool. Even the, even the teacher's like, wow, you know, yeah, that was it. Was cool. I was, uh, music was always from the day I was born. It was always in the house. It was always, you know. So there was always a. Uh, think to this day, my my father is he's great hardcore music. Everything's about jazz, and you know he likes he'd rather listen to music than watch TV. So so there you go. That's very cool. Was was there was there anything that that he kind of exposed you to that was really. I don't know, off the wall, different, you know, it was like, oh my God, nobody else has heard this. Or, you know, was it one of those things where you heard it long before anybody else knew about it? Um, probably Frank Sinatra. Like, you know, obviously he, he was very popular, but for people that are my age, they, they didn't want to hear that kind of stuff. And, uh, you know, to this day, I still, I still get a kick out of hearing, you know, old blue eyes there, you know. And, uh, stuff like that, and, and the Beatles and stuff like that. But I can't think of anything out of the ordinary that because uh, it was it was more top top uh, forty type stuff. So a lot of Casey and the Sunshine Band. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Joy and Abba. There must have been a lot of Abba back in the day too. <laughs> all, all the above. All the above. Yeah. 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 <laughs> now there's nothing wrong with Abba. Well, good too. Uh, well, the play is good, Mamma Mia. You get to see the play, some, Mamma Mia. Put some makeup on them, and we yeah, can talk. M M Mitch is reserving his comments on support for Abba. I can see. <laughs> <laughs> how about uh, how, how about um, concerts? What were the the first concerts you remember going to? First one I ever went to was Slade at the Apollo in Glasgow, Scotland. Wow, was years old. And I went to my second concert a week later in Liverpool, which was Queen on the Queen 2 tour. Whoa. Nice. nice. Awesome. Yeah, I got the Very nice. And some... you got to hear all the songs that Quiet Riot made popular before Quiet Riot, <laughs> Quiet Riot made them popular. <laughs> the way they should have been done. That's the way they were always done. That's right. Yeah. Naughty Holder. <laughs> hey, my first concert was... Uh, the Doobie Brothers with uh, special guest Rory Gallagher, and I think it was in grade seven. Oh, wow. wow. That was the first concert. And then after that, it was like all Van Halen and Kiss, all the, 
you know, Kiss Destroyer. That was my first Kiss tour. I seen everyone after that, Rock and Roll Over and Love Gun and all that fun stuff. So there you go. Now, yeah. now, because your dad was in radio, were you uh, able to get great seats and go back and meet the artists? Well, like I said, we were living up in Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario, which is north, yeah. north, north. So a lot, a lot of the big, big acts never came up there too much. And uh, and if they did, I was too small. You know, my dad wanted to go party and wanted any little kids, <laughs> kids around. <laughs> Get away from me, kid! You're cramping my style. There's yeah. funny groupies over there. Yeah. <laughs> um yeah you know for me it, it, it my first concert was interesting because i was into music as a kid but for whatever reason i never realized bands actually came and played live until i was in high school and and then i was just it one year it all of a sudden hit me i'm like you mean holy crap i can go see these bands in concert and play my favorite music and I think the year I discovered bands in concert, I went to like 18 concerts in that first year. I was just like nuts for it. <laughs> so what was the first concert? Uh, my first concert was Molly Hatchet, and I think oh. opening for them was either Saxon and or UFO. Wow. Oh, wow. It was an interesting, interesting bill. Interesting bill. I, all I remember is, back, you know, so this would have been in the – early 80s it seemed like either saxon or ufo was on everybody's bill as an opener or a third act at that time yeah yeah for sure yeah they were trying to build it over here would you like to yep. guess what band i saw first <laughs> it wasn't <laughs> abba was it no mm -hmm. uh, well kiss. technically technically it was new england but they were opening for kiss on the dynasty okay. tour <laughs> august 6 1979 montreal forum <laughs> Mitch, wow. you've got, you've got such great a, show that was. Mitch, you have such a wide taste in music here. <laughs> I, I know. It's, it, it all, well, listen, it all started with Kiss. After that, I saw Cheap Trick. I saw Tease. I saw uh, Rush, you know, April Wine, uh, Ted Nugent. I saw them all doing the, the Bells, Aerosmith, all doing the, uh, the, the Montreal Forum. So that in itself was a special... It was a special venue because at the time, the Montreal Canadiens had the most championships of any professional sports Here team. Here we go. Here we go. <laughs> Back today. No, but the four. I mean, seeing shows at the four. Just I mean, the time. It's a throwdown. It is. <laughs> the but gloves listen, are off. <laughs> you you got to think, in the 70s and 80s, they had more more, more Stanley Cups than the Yankees had World oh, Series. Michael, and, what are you, do we have to sit for this? <laughs> Yeah, Come on. you gotta you gotta put up with it, sure. you know. I don't remember the interview. That was all this crap. <laughs> Listen, Jeez. I can appreciate that you're Leaf fans, and so you're happy that there's oh, a strike oh, here. Chicago Blackhawks, Chicago oh, Blackhawks, Stan uh, 2000 Stanley Cup champions. By the way, when was the last time Montreal won the Stanley Cup? Well, at least has got the King. Uh, you know, I, I, I grew up as a Minnesota North Stars fan. <laughs> and when the, when, the, when the North Stars left to go to Dallas, that was just like a knife in the heart. What the yeah. hell is Dallas doing with a hockey team in Minnesota with no hockey? Yeah. Oh, hey. And you lost your basketball team back in the day over to, to the Lakers. They became the Lakers, so... Yeah, well, at least we can lay claim to the fact that we were what, what made the Lakers. Yeah, well, you gave them their name. But listen, back in the day, Stan the Man Makita and Tony Esposito Blackhawks, I was, I'm was i in for that, too. Now but, we're talking. Bobby Hall. Talk. Enough said, Bobby Hall. Uh, Bobby Hall. Back, back over to, to music for a second, though. Uh, yeah, seeing that we're on the... Uh, uh, on the Canadian topics and stuff, uh, up here we have something called CanCon, Canadian content. Um, what is your take on CanCon? Did it help the band or did it hinder the band? It probably helped us in the beginning. Okay. I mean, the fact that we were signed to a major obviously gave us a better opportunity. But I think it probably helped a lot of the independent stuff. It was men's that had risen smaller labels that had done okay because of the CanCon rule. Um, 
I think I think it was a good thing. I know that you know people like uh, Brian Adams' manager, forget his Brian name. Allen, Bruce Allen, Bruce Allen. Yeah, got yeah. all pissy about it and and saying you know because he didn't get nominated for a Juno because it was a song he did with Sting or Stewart. But I think it helped breed a lot of good Canadian talent. Um, the problem was is just. Uh, Canadians have always been so reserved that they don't really believe that their artists can succeed uh, in country, and they always welcome them back after they've gone somewhere else. Like Neil Young, on the last more said, Johnny Mitchell, Rush, all those guys had success in the U.S. and oh yeah, which has made it's it's an attitude that's that's gone now, but it was really relevant, I think, in the '60s, '70s, and '80s. Almost like yeah. we're, we're it's inferiority complex. For, sure. for for Americans and people watching outside of Canada, Cana CanCon means Canadian content, and our broadcasters are uh, expected, or in fact mandated, to play a certain amount of Canadian bands, Canadian films, can so, you know, Canadian content. And so, uh, but also, did it not geographically sort of encourage record companies to keep you local and and not export you to the UK and not export you to to the US? No, because. It it worked out for them because they got a higher royalty. When we sold it, they get paid a higher royalty back on it. Or in Japan, was one of the highest in the world. Uh, it's just that, you know, the main reason that a lot of the majors signed Canadian artists wasn't because they wanted Canadian, uh, a, lead, a Canadian artist signed to them. They just, they got paid by the government. It's a thing called the Star Fund a lot of people don't know about. Then when they sign a Canadian band, they get 50 grand right up front. Now, they don't tell you about that, and they don't take it off the money they advance you. So they're already starting with a pretty good penny in the, in the, in the pot before they move any further. So that's, it, it was just their way. Obviously, there's corporate tax breaks and everything else. That's why right. there's division set up here and less and less of them. But I think, you know, there, there were people that came along in the in, in the industry, people like Jack Richardson. Um, right. You know, you know, I guess that took it to a whole different level and kind of made people realize, you know what, there are some good bands up there, there's some talent up there, and, and that's what's moved it forward for a lot of people. Even now, you see more of them do better internationally than they did in our day. Um, you know, we were one of the that did better in Europe than we did in Canada to begin with. Um, now they were, you know, Our Lady Peace and I Mother Earth, all those guys, they, they had success internationally fairly quick. And right. a lot of that had with the, the people that were employed in the business now. Right. Now, were you also affected by, uh, what was it called, Video Fact? The, the money the government gives you to make music we videos? We got it on Can't Wait for the Night video, Our and then, first one. then we were ineligible because we were signed to a major label. So what they did is restricted that one for independent artists, um, okay. and it was no longer available to us. It would have been nice. You know? Absolutely. Now, now that you're coming back in, in 2013 with a new album, are you eligible for any of these things? Do you still have to follow CanCon rules, or can you do a video uh, fact video? We, we probably could now. There probably would be something there. Um, but I mean, like, we've already got interest from majors to distribute the record. Right, uh, Universal. So, yeah, yeah. So, you know, we can do trust with Universal. We, we could go back to Warner. We, we still know all those guys and deal with them. I deal with them on a business, on a business level daily. Uh, so we could look at that. But I think right now we're just more interested in putting it together. And then we'll see what we want to do with it after it's all finished and we don't really need to rely on the technology and everything else now it's not as if we have to block book a studio for a month and have a hundred grand budget um you can do everything good quality at a lot more reasonable rate and then we'll see what offers come to the table from that point so so let me let me ask you guys let's back up a little bit so you know brighton rock was around late 80s early 90s you did uh three albums you were on atco records it was here in the u.s and yeah. then, then you broke up. And then over the last, I don't know what, eight to ten years, there's been a spotty show here and there, but nothing like a real, hey, we're back. Now, all of a sudden, within the last couple months, it's more of, we're back. You know, is this, do you look at this as a reunion? And why now? What, what brought it about now that you said, let's actually take this one step further than just doing a one-off show? Well... I think a lot of it had to do with just the time of life that we're at. Um, everybody's gone on to do their own thing, uh, have their own families, uh, move on to other jobs and other, other things in life. And we would get together, we would do the odd show, and it was solely for the purpose of fun. Uh, we never really broke up. Uh, we never really went away. We've always kept in contact. Uh, it's just time has been the biggest factor 
against it. And then when we got together to do these shows, first the one in England came up, uh, and we've done one in 2001, I think, and then another one in Germany after that. And just the whole vibe from people was amazing. And I think YouTube and Facebook, all that stuff is such a huge uh, thing to, to back that up and move it forward and open it up to people that probably never even knew who we were before that. And doing the live shows and just being absolutely gobsmacked that, you know, people singing the songs, half of them were even born when we did them. Mm-hmm. And it's like, you know what? We're having fun. We're all still healthy. Let's do another kick at the can. It may be the last kick at it, but let's go out and have a laugh. And that's kind of rolled in from just shows to now, okay, you know what? Let's do some new tunes. And then let's throw it out there and go out and do some more shows. And it's always been about doing shows for us. Even in the early days, we recorded records so we could go on tour. We were road dogs. That's what we did. We played, you know, 21 nights in a row, 10 nights in a row. We just wanted to play in front of people. And in order to be able to do that, we had to create our own music to try and expand that audience. And now it's back to where everybody's at a comfortable position in their life where we can fit it in scheduling wise. And like I say, we all still get along so well. So it makes it easier to kind of put it back together. So so from the standpoint of touring, is your hope that this will be something where you're going to be able to put together some small tours more than just heading over to the UK and playing Firefest or, you know, the, the, the few festival shows? Do you hope to do a, a bigger string of dates? For sure, yeah. yeah. I mean... The days of tours, as you say, are pretty well gone. Nobody does big tours right, anymore. Right, But uh, we definitely want to do as many shows as we can. Uh, we got offered to do uh, the Firefest show there in October. That's what kind of got us back together. We get offered shows every once in a while. Most of the time it was like charity stuff. That's what we were doing in the last 15 years, do the odd charity show. But it was never really a full-blown reunion, like you said. Right. And uh, we did a warm-up show before we did Firefest in Toronto, and it really got the blood going. It's like, wow, man, we can't we can't believe how much people still miss us, and they it really you know brought back a lot of memories, and uh, we're really excited about it. So we'd love to do a whack of shows. So you want us to come down to San Francisco and uh, do a show? I, for- I'd love to. I mean, you you guys are actually one of the bands on my list of I've never never seen you live, and you're the band I want to see live. So yeah. Need, need to do a California show. If you get to California, I'll go wherever the show is. <laughs> yeah, well, we've had, I mean, we've already, we've got another Toronto show next April. We've uh, just been signed up to do a Canada Day show in Belleville, uh, an nice. outdoor festival. Uh, we've got a bunch of girls in Florida that are trying to get us on that Monsters of Rock cruise. Oh, okay. Oh, that's, oh I yeah. know the guy. I got somebody on that cruise already. Set him up, Mitch. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Well, I probably love. could. I, I, I spoke to the uh, organizer and I got Russ Dwarf on that tour. So there you go. Yeah. Well, look at it. If we're not on that tour, it's your fault. <laughs> uh, I'll send we're an email. Me. I'll send an email and ask. <laughs> so so let let let's let's talk a little bit about uh, the music for the new album. What you know? How how far along are you with this? Are you just writing? Have you started recording? No recording. Uh, I've been writing myself. I've been. I got a lot of songs that are ready to go. It's just a matter of uh, getting this Christmas and New Year's out of the way, and we're gonna really hunker down and uh, you know get things done. But uh, we're raring to go, man, and we're excited because we got some killer songs. May I ask you a question about the writing process? Do you? How has it changed? I mean, you're no longer 20 years old. Do you? What kind of texts are you gonna put together? Is it still you know? Breakup songs? Do you, do you try to come up with something that's sort of more mature themed, or do you just, you know, how, how do you write for for today's market and for for the band today? Pure, we, pure death metal. <laughs> <laughs> it's all about write, taxes. <laughs> we don't write for any market. Uh, we just okay. write for ourselves, and and that's what we've always did. It's like uh, as soon as you try to write for whatever's hot. By the time your record comes out, which is usually about a year later from your starting point, whatever is big then is already passed. So you, you can't rely on that. We just stick to our guns. It's like, hey, man, we all like this song. Let's put this out. And whatever vibe that uh, you know is there, Jerry latches onto that, and he writes some great words and stuff. You know, So usually I'll, re- I'll come up with some kind of a riff and some kind of a melody to, to get the, the ball rolling. And... Jerry hears it and he goes, oh, this brings me to this. And then uh, he writes some great words and 
that's the way we're going to do it this time, hopefully. Yeah, in, the, in the past, we always did where Fraze would, would get everything together and then get with the guys and whatever writing was going to be done, and then it would come to me last uh, sort of thing. But just with technology now, I mean, this is the first time that I've sent Fraze and Johnny four sheets of lyrics and said, here's four songs that I got. Take them first and see how they go. So we're kind of mismatching it. Mm -hmm. um, just because of technology now, you can blast an email off. It's not as if you have to get together or relay stuff over the phone. So that'll we'll see how it all plays out, but we'll probably stick to the same formula because it's 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 going to sound like BR. It's just it's not going to be any different. It, it would have been what the next BR record would have been like. But back in the '80s and '90s, did you not get record company interference where they would listen to the material and say? I don't hear a single here. You need to, you know, you need to add a baby, baby at the end of this song. You need to throw in another, you know, anything like that going on. Our Back manager, then? Or the record company, yeah, yeah, yeah. Our yeah. manager was was bad for that, but the label did. And and a perfect example is all our videos were mostly always ballads. Uh, you right. know, people see one more try that. and they they come see us live and we open up with Unleash the Rage and they go, oh my God, is this the same band? <laughs> you know. And, you know, Night Stalker or Bulletproof, but the video we make is for Still the One. Like the hardest video we ever did was, and it was our best video, was Hollywood Shuffle. Yeah. Because that's what we were. We were we were a hard rock band. And they wanted us to fit into the bubble gum and, you know, I want the band on the cover and you got to have a ballad. You know, and then the same thing, we were writing Jack is Back and The Outlaw. It was, it, they tried to tame us down. We were a lot more on the edge than most Canadian bands. Right. And when we did Love Machine, I mean, we basically got banned by much music because I told them this album didn't have a condo. We don't practice safe sex anymore, so get ready. <laughs> it's like, yeah. you can't see that on TV. Uh, so, you know, so, it ain't around. It's like, oops. Oh, yeah, oops. <laughs> hey, the lucky, we were going to call the, the album Come Taste the Band. Oh. <laughs> so so let, here, here's, here's a, a fun question. All the way back to Young, Wild, and Free. The wardrobe you wore on that album cover. Was yeah. that you guys? Was that management? Or was that a record label saying, this is what you guys need to wear because you need to look like this band? I mean, the, the thing that stands out for me is I don't remember which guy it was who had the pants with the cartoon characters all over it. Arky. That was our <laughs> arc, yeah. Yeah, that was the Judge Dredd. Judge Dredd, yeah. Yeah. A, a little bit of both. The, 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 the best guy who always caused shit was Stevie. Because whatever they had picked out for him, he didn't like it. He was going to wear what he wanted to wear. In fact, I think he's probably the only guy on those tours that never wore the clothes he wore on the cover. <laughs> right, yeah. Everybody else would, we, we would basically put together on all the future records, what we had in those wardrobes was, it was almost like a kiss costume to us. Right. That's going to be our outfit for that tour. You know, the, the British pants, the American pants for the Love Machine tour, Take a Deep Breath was all the ripped jeans. So we kind of did that all ourselves. In the beginning, it was probably 50-50 because, I mean, we were 22, 23 years old. We were signed to a major label and, you know, it just kind of, we were completely in awe and blind and we were trusting these people because, you know, you're Warner Music Canada and the manager, the manager's not even sweet. You know what we need to do. As we evolved along, we took more and more control, especially on Love Machine. I mean, we fired the manager. We basically co-produced that record. Uh, the label let us do whatever we wanted. The only the only interference we really had for them is we had a song on that record called Gang Bang, which was uh, an Alex Harvey remake, and uh, they refused to put it on the record. But in the same turn, they put in Skid Row's Get the Fuck Out on their album, where we couldn't say that stuff, but they could get away with it. Mm -hmm. so, so that was the only interference. So where can we get a copy of that song? You know, we're just me and Fraser talking about that because I got somewhere and... Uh, Everything was it passed around warmth to get the the uh, box to everybody because we used to do it live and all the women would go on front and cheer and ain't nothing like a gangbang to blow away the blues and the women didn't like it it just happened to be that there were some VPs that were a little bit ah uh, there it is and <laughs> they didn't get the whole what it was about so they were the ones that pulled the plug on you might see it on our new record yeah. though <laughs> pull it back out so so what we can do. What's the time frame for the uh, the new record? I mean, I know you're kind of just doing it all on your own here, but are you hoping to have it out so you can be doing something this summer, this fall? Realistically, it's going to take at least a year, realistically. We might release a single or two, uh, like an advanced single, just to you know keep people's interest and stuff like that. But uh, 
we're not going to release until it's done. We're not going to rush it. We don't want a deadline because it's like, oh my God, okay, we're, we're approaching the deadline. Let's just get it out, get it out, and then look back later. God, I wish we would have spent a little bit more time on this or that, you know. So I'm thinking at least a year. So I'm hoping next. <laughs> well, well, there you go. I'm hoping in time for that Canada Day show in Belleville, quite frankly. Uh, well, I guarantee there'll be a couple new tunes in it. There you go. Uh, let me ask you quickly already- about, now you're, you're in control of the whole project. Is it challenging for you to be in control? Is it scary or is it, uh, you know, a breath of fresh air? All of the above. Yeah, we, we, you know what, it's a different scenario because uh, we right. were really in control of Love Machine. We, we didn't have a manager for that whole thing. Basically, it fell to the band's uh, judgment of what we wanted to do. We desperately tried to get uh, a U.S. manager. Uh, we had interest from Thaler, who had Motley Crue, Doug Banker, who had Nugent, and every single one of them looked at our record contract and said, you guys are screwed. We'd love the band. We'd love to sign you but you guys are screwed. There's nothing we can do with your contract. We even hired our own attorneys in the States uh, who shot the album down there, and we had giant records ready to pick it up, and all it took was a call from the VP of Canada to say, I want this, make it happen, and he refused to do it. Mm-hmm. So by that time, they'd already pushed us aside, and we realized that, and that's why we went away. We knew that we were basically screwed, blued, and tattooed, <laughs> so it's time to kind of go away. Hmm. So, so it's tough. To, it, oh, go ahead. I was going to say, so... You know, your plans now with Universal, are you just going to license the finished recording to them and still retain full ownership? Well, we'll wait and see. I mean, they'll probably, they might want to do it through one of their distributed labels. Um, You know, there's a few up here that work strictly on their Canadian artists. Um, We might license it. We might just keep it ourselves and we might give it some. It all depends. We're in a position where we can really do what we want. We don't really need them to make this happen. Um, we can get it to the people with the internet and Amazon and eBay and websites. It's a lot more easier to get it out there. So we can do deals in certain territories where we license it. You know, Europe obviously would be one that would go first because we've still got a good fan base over there. But we're just gonna we're just gonna concentrate on the record, and then once that's done, then we'll then we'll deal with the business end of it. Yeah, once you get a few songs like under our belt, we can kind of hand them out a bit and then get people's interest. But right now, it's kind of hard to get interest without something to show them you know that way we can drive a price too yeah we, you know. but i mean i guess, I guess what it sounds like to me is you're not sitting here going we need to get signed to another record deal no, no that's not what you want at, at no. any at any means no no we've got far too much money now to worry about that <laughs> <laughs> the shares of tim hortons have paid off <laughs> So, so Jerry, let me let me ask you if you can shed a little light on this. I've I've read a few places that you auditioned for Motley Crue. No, what happened was is uh, when they kicked out Vince Neil, Michael Wagner, who did our first record, was managed by Thaler, and Thaler knew who we were because we'd given him Love Machine when we were shopping, and he was absolutely floored uh, of the version of Cocaine that we did, and they called Warner. And the guy at the time, Roger Desjardins, a great guy. He was the head of artist relations. He knew everybody. Um, he called me and he said, hey, look, it, uh, they're auditioning a guy, but they wanted to let you know that you're next if he doesn't work out. And then what ended up happening is I auditioned with the screen. So they um, uh, said, okay, well, this is all going down because we were on tour. We were in the middle of Love Machine tour. And uh, we knew that we were going to call it a day. Uh, at this point, we we're just going to put it, put it to bed and wait a little while. And I went down and auditioned uh, with those guys. But I never physically auditioned with the crew. But, I mean, that was I could have got drunk in any bar in Canada because it was all over everywhere. I was a Molly crew. And the next thing I knew, I was in Judas Priest after that one. When Alfred left. I'd go home and I'd answer my phone. There'd be like 600 messages. Dude, congratulations, you're in the crew. Uh, no, I'm not in the crew. And radio stations were announcing it, which made it worse. I think it was almost like a game with them. It was like, where's Waldo? It's who's Jerry singing for today. <laughs> <laughs> How did that affect the band? I mean, while you're off, you're, you're on this tour and you're auditioning, do they resent you? Do they support you? How, how did it affect the band? Well, we already decided that we were going to call it a day. Okay. So it just kind of, it was almost like kind of timing and it's like, you know what, 
let's just let's just take a break from each other you know the, you know we were up for a hard rock album of the year Juno and and Stevie went to the Junos I didn't go that year and he came and he came back and called me when it was done he said dude let's just call it a day yeah he said they treated us like we had the plague and here we are nominated you know for hard rock record of the year we made mm -hmm. the album we wanted to make let's just you know let's just take some time away and see how things transpire and at that point I was getting ready to move to LA I had friends down there and I really felt that I was a bit bitter just because of the whole Canadian thing because I thought if we'd ever got our shot, um, you know, th there's lots of bands that came from this country that if we'd have been given the opportunity they were given, we'd have sold well over a million records in Absolutely. the States and other places because there was really, there were a lot of bands out there that, that may have been better in us in certain aspect, but there was nobody that we felt could kick our ass live and that was always what this band was about. Um, everything we did on record, we did live and we knew how to make people have fun and remember the shows and you know 30 years later they're still coming back because they know that it's 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 entertainment it was what it was all about to us and we just you know the, there's only a certain amount of money that separates separates you know Def Leppards and Bon Jovi's from you know Brighton Rocks and Danger Dangers and all those other kind of guys it's all the record company money and the luck of the draw right but the Canadian bands that I've spoken to Killer Dwarves Helix Honeymoon Suite, Lawrence Gowan, they all have the same story. It, it seems as yeah. though the Canadian industry worked against you for some kind reason. They, they were happy with you playing downtown Toronto, but yeah. don't go anywhere else. Well, a perfect example for us is when we went to England. I mean, they spent so much money on Blue Rodeo and Honeymoon Suite over there. And our right. first record sold 30,000 albums just in England alone. We right. sold on all five shows in under an hour. Mm -hmm. And... You know, they said, we, this, our plan was always Canada, Europe, U.S. That's the way we were going to do it. Right. We're gold in Canada, well on our way to platinum. We sold out the shows in the U.K. We sold a ton of records in Germany. And when we went to go back, they said, no, we don't want you back. They yeah. didn't want to give any support. But in the meantime, they were paying $60,000 a week for Honeymoon Suite to open up for Sticks. Yeah, they you know, it's funny. Tour. Yeah, I spoke to Lawrence Gowan uh, many times over the last year, and he said the same thing. He started in Canada, yeah. went over to the UK, and then they said, "Just stay there. Yeah. We don't want you well, back." We, we did a show. We did a show at the Marquee, which you know, for mm -hmm. rock and roll, is almost right. like legendary, legendary. Right. And and Guns and the Roses. Owner, everybody there. Yeah, and the, and the owner came in, and upstairs there's a room uh, right. where where the party was held, and they had the the contracts for all the artists: Jimi Hendrix, uh, Queen. Uh, Judas Priest and he said when are you going to be on my wall he says because you guys are going to be on that wall I'm saving your contract and we went downstairs we met with the head guy of WEA in the UK and we said so what'd you think and he was hmm yeah. okay and we said you're Canadian Does everybody <laughs> sell out the marquee on a Tuesday night I know we sold it out and man. he said oh no 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 that never happens we said well what is it and he said well it's the music and remember this is 1989 uh, what's wrong with the music? He goes, it's kind of dated. I go, well, dated? He goes, yeah, like Bon Jovi, Def Leppard. And these guys were selling 9 million records. Yes. And dealing with a record company guy like that, see, his cup of tea was Blue Rodeo. Right. So he always liked to smoke a big hash tube and then <laughs> sit there and, you know, veg out to whatever, you know, smoke it with the band, who knows. And even our record company in Canada itself, they never really understood us. No. They, they never really understood why we were becoming successful and why we, we created the buzz we did. Because the people that worked there weren't the type of people that would listen to our music on their way home from work. They would play something a little bit more safe. So they always relied on other people's opinion of what we are to, to be sold sold on it, you know. So that that was a big thing, too. It's like, well, eh, brain rock, whatever, you know, whatever. Where a band like Blue, Blue Rodeo, they can physically get behind it because they generally, generally like that music. It's safe. Yeah. It's safe, you know. But the only thing that we... Warner is we probably got more reps laid across the country from coming to our shows and hooking them up with chicks than any other band. <laughs> so let me ask you, so when, when you guys made the decision to break up, it wasn't because of personality, infighting, anything like no. that. It was more of we we just we can't we can't we can't play this game, we can't beat the industry anymore. We need to walk away from it. We ran its, its course. Yeah. I mean, what we started back what was our first tour, like uh, eighty four, something like that. You know, so then you're looking at like eight, nine years later, we're going back to some of the same clubs we played. Like something's like, God, here we are again. What's this our thirtieth time play? Yeah. After a while, like you start climbing the ladder, and then you reach a plateau, 
and you're not getting any higher. You're, you're reaching, you're staying right there. And we realize, like, man, we, something's got to change because, you know, and it didn't. And we, like, like Jerry said, we fired our manager. We tried to get a new record uh, company in the States, and it wasn't happening. So once the writing was on the wall, it's like, you know, let's just, let's just sit back and, you know, let grunge do its thing because they weren't playing our type of music on the radio anymore. They weren't playing our videos. They weren't giving us tour support. Like, Everything we were doing seemed like we were going against the grain. And uh, there was no light at the end of the tunnel anymore. There always was, but not now. Now it's like, hmm. So that's what it is. We took a break, and that break turned out to be 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and that- you know, Mike, I find that story so similar to all other Canadian bands I've, I've dealt with and spoken to. Uh, you know, the, uh, the record companies seem to get them out there enough so that they can get them on much music to, to meet the CanCon requirement, but not push them out of the nest to make them fly. And it's a sad story. It seems as though the Canadian record companies just use them as, you know, pawns in a game. Get, get some CanCon and then throw them to the garbage. Yeah, it seems yeah. like there's a lot of Canadian music and bands that are in that category of almost. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Could Didn't have, quite do it, but almost did. Yeah, for sure. It's like that with a lot of other countries, too. I mean, it's not just Canada. There's a lot of big bands that should have been bigger. But, uh, you know, we're not whining. We're just excited about the new Bright Rock. Yeah. Racing hearts beat at the neon lights Entangled in dark feelings Still some hearts stand alone Soon he sees the light The thrill belongs to the night this time love may arrive, keeps him alive, so alive, can't wait for the night, oh, can't wait for the night, for the night, can't wait for the night. You know it's alright, alright Thirst for action and desire You know sometimes love doesn't matter It goes crying out his name Chasing shadows with no face but soon he sees the light The thrill belongs to the night This time love may arrive It keeps you alive So alive Can't wait for the night Night. Can't wait for the night. Oh, the night. Can't wait for the night. You know it's all right. And I sit waiting for the night. <laughs> Can't wait for the night, for the 
nights. I can't wait for the nights. You know it's alright. Oh, I can't wait for the nights. For the nights. Can't wait for the nights. For the night. Ooh, yeah. Can't wait for the night. You know it's alright. Can't wait. Right, that was night. Thanks so much. Uh, can't wait for the night. That was off of Young, Wild, and Free, right? The first right. full length album? Our yeah. first video, I think it might have been our, was that second. Our first, that out. was our second video. That's right, yeah. Second video. Is that, is, do you, is that one of the more popular songs people want to hear all the time? I mean, what, what, are, what are the songs that you have to do? You know, Kiss has to do rock and roll all night. What does Brighton Rock have to do? Can't wait for the night. One more try. We came to rock. We came to rock. Hanging high and dry. Hanging high and dry. Mostly, mostly the video stuff. Yeah. Okay. But we don't always do what we're supposed to do. <laughs> okay. So here, here's here's the question. No fan wants to hear. What song are you sick and tired of playing over and over again? I can't think of any. When you wait 10 years in between shows, that's kind of hard. <laughs> Exactly. Right, right now you're like, you can't wait to play them all. <laughs> I think when we were on tour on a regular basis, I probably got sick of playing We Came to Rock. Okay. But this last time, the last shows, it was like a brand new song again, and I really got into it. It's just weird. It's just, you know, it was one of those songs because it was our first video that no matter what show we did, it had to be in there. It was the first exposure a lot of people had got to us, whether it was MTV or much music. So it kind of, you know, and it's so different from the other stuff, you know, like Unleashed and Outlaw and Jack and Bulletproof and Night Stalker and you know, all the death stuff we used to <laughs> But you know the thing is, too, like a lot of times, um, you know, when you're in a band, you're writing music, sometimes you got to compromise on songs like to get on the record and, it, meaning like, well, okay, well, I guess we'll put that on her. But meanwhile, you're not really 100%. 99.9% of the time, we're all 100% behind the songs. You know, because you got like 30 or 40 songs, you narrow down to 10. We can all look at each other in the eye and say, you know what? Those are the songs. We, we love those songs. So I, I don't get sick of any of the songs because I love them so much going into it, you know? Right. I mean, I've read articles uh, where Joe Perry says – if I got to play Dream On one more time, I'm going to puke. It's like, wow. You know? But we, I don't, I mean, when we start a song, as soon as it, you know, I'll start at the beginning of a song or somebody starts it and the crowd goes crazy, how can you, how can you be bummed out? I mean, it's like, oh, God. Are, are you going to, you know, this is something Kiss did specifically with like, I Was Made for Loving You. You know, they took the disco song and they still play that live, but they've kind of mm. metalized it, rocked it out. It's no longer disco sounding. Are you going to take any of those early songs that aren't necessarily real Brighton Rock feel and make them a little heavier to suit your tastes? Yeah, I got to disagree with you because I think everything we did was pure Brighton Rock. I don't think we we settled for anything where you know we can go. Well, I got to wish we didn't release that song. There's one song that we did on Take a Deep Breath that some of the guys uh, it's called Ride the Rainbow, and. Uh, we, we initially, when we went in, it was it was a more hard rocking song, and our producer he thought, you know what, that song's a single. We're going what this song? I don't know. It's pretty hard edge, so we kind of stripped it down a bit and made it more accessible. Uh, that's one song where I can think I would say that we're not a hundred percent behind. But having said that, you'd be surprised how many people would want us to play that song live because they love right. that version. So, but but some of the older stuff has got. Uh, uh, a harder edge to it now, mainly because in a lot of the, the earlier stuff where John just played keyboards, he's out playing guitar. Well, that, I was right. just going to say, you know, some of the yeah. earlier stuff, which is real heavy keyboards, maybe the yeah. keyboards are not going to be as out front as they used to be. Yeah, yeah, like Barry Katie plays guitar on, mm -hmm. uh, Young, Wild, and Free. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, those two songs Yeah, on the, in the studio, they're both keyboards and one guitar. Yeah. Live, we used two guitars and got rid of the keyboards, so... Maybe that, that that's what you're talking about. We're yeah, not going to go yeah, take. Yeah, yeah, I'm not yeah, saying. I'm not, not I wasn't talking about just intentionally like rewriting the song, but 
oh, you know, man. it just musically, like as you just said, less keyboard, more guitar. Yeah, it's it's, it's, it's you know more, more just to feel the way we are now, I guess. Right. We're right. Older, grungier and harder. Right. Right. <laughs> so, Mitch, anything else you want to uh, ask a couple fellow Canadians? Outside well, of hockey, just real quick. Well, outside of hockey, just after that performance, any thought of doing a, a an unplugged or acoustic album? Uh I don't know. Do you think we should? Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I do. Should. Yeah, I do. You know, it's a lot of things. I mean, uh, why not? Let's get this record out of the, out of the way, and then we'll see what happens. But uh, I'll tell you what, that was fun. What we just did. We don't. That's the only version, like known to man, of us playing just the, with me and Jerry yeah. doing an acoustic version of that song. So that, there's a first, and uh, that was fun. So yeah, sure, maybe yeah, we'll know, do another one. Maybe 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 do like a four song acoustic EP. Release that yeah. between now and the the actual album release. Have something to whet people's appetites. There you go. I think. Well, I can assure you, we, yeah, I can assure you, we never say never again, except with ex-girlfriends and ex-wives. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so just, go ahead, Mitch. I was just thinking, you know, with iTunes and stuff like that, it's a nice way to, you know, keep the fire burning as you release one of your new songs. And if there's time in between, you just put a little acoustic thing together, throw it on iTunes, keep the fans coming back, checking yeah. out Brighton Rock on iTunes, make sure the interest stays or... You know, works for me. Yeah, I, I never have a problem with not having Stevie on the stage. He already takes too much of it when he's there. So we can leave. <laughs> what, what, one, one, Stevie streams. <laughs> <laughs> one quick question about the uh, the back catalog. You guys don't have any control over over the those getting re released or put up on Spotify and streaming services, do you? No, unfortunately, um, we do have uh, through my company here. We have Take a Deep Breath and Love Machine that we distribute through Amazon and through uh, ScreamingCD.com, which is a website that, that carries all that stuff, and the uh, the Brighton Rock uh, website. But we were surprised, we were in England, to unfortunately find out that Warner had just licensed those two records to a German company for the rest of the world for five years, and uh, so we don't even have any control of the way they're going to look being put out. We were a little bit perturbed, to say in the least, and that happened, and we knew nothing about it until we showed up at the show, and there was a full-page ad in the program saying, remastered and reissued, Love Machine and Take a Deep Breath. So it's, it's unfortunate, but no, we don't have any control. Nothing right. ever changes. Yeah, 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 yep, yep, exactly. Yeah. And that's why a, a nice album of acoustic re-releases is a way to go. At least you gain control of those versions. And we could screw them. There you go. It'll, it'll, be, it'll be interesting to see what gets re-released and remastered when your new album is going to be released. Right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You got so, it. So, yeah. so um, let's just wrap things up here with where can people find you guys online? Websites, Facebook, what, where do you want people to go? Brightonrock.ca, and, and we have a Brighton Rock group page on Facebook. Those two, those are the two hot spots, I guess you could say. And, and you can always find me and Phrase on Facebook. We're Facebook whores. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we <find> everybody. <laughs> <laughs> and, and and you guys, I, I know this for a fact. You guys are actually personally involved. It's not like you've got, you know, some assistant who's pretending they're That's the a, band. It's it's you guys. You know, it's, yeah, it says we've got these massive egos that we still need to feed. <laughs> exactly. What better way to feed an ego than get on Facebook and let fans <laughs> praise you, right? <laughs> and we still get pictures from hot chicks. We're not that old. <laughs> <laughs> now, now, now you're just putting together the digital little black book for the tour, right? Right. Uh, yeah. Everything's on an iPhone. Now exactly. An <laughs> exactly. Yeah. All right, guys. Well, this was a this was a big honor for me. Uh, I love chatting with you. I love catching up. I'm excited that uh, there's going to be some new Brighton Rock music, uh, you know, in the future here. The sooner the better for me. But I understand you need to do it right. You need to take your time to get it done. But, uh, you know, thanks for joining us so much. This was awesome. Uh, our pleasure. Uh, thanks for having us. Another. Thanks for thinking of us. Hope to do it again one day with you. And yeah. Green Bay Packers over Minnesota this Sunday, Mike. Oh, no way. It's got yeah, yeah. to be the Vikings. I know you're like, Vikings yeah, over Packers. Packers. Again. Although I'm, I'm, I'm so used to and ready for the Vikings to blow it at the very last minute and just lose everything. They always do. They will. Don't worry. <laughs> Mitch is a Redskins fan. 
Yeah, the Redskins are going to this to the uh, playoffs this year. You'll see. Not to the Super Bowl. Yeah. No, uh, not that hopeful. But I think we can get at least past one wild card. <laughs> All right, guys. Thanks so much. Uh, this is uh, another episode of Dropping the Needle. I am one of your co-hosts, Michael Brandvold, and as always. Mitch LaFon is joining me from Montreal, Canada, and thanks to our special guest, Brighton Rock. Thanks, thanks guys. guys. Thank you. Been listening to Dropping the Needle. Dropping the Needle with Michael Branvold and Mitch LaFon.